Hey y'all, um, so uh, we're going to pick up where we left off with last time. Um, so last time we did talk about energy and how to calculate the energy. And now it's more of an application of that sort of concept. So this right here is called the atomic emission spectrum. Uh, right here on the left side is a gas discharge tube. In this gas discharge tube is one single element, hydrogen. Now, when you put a current through it, so put some electricity through it, uh, the hydrogen will give off some light. And then that light is then passed through a couple of slits um, for reasons we won't get to today. And it passes through print which then breaks up the individual components of the of the uh, light coming from hydrogen so the color that hydrogen again is made of what you normally see with your naked eye is actually a combination of these four colors right here and these four colors constitute what is called the atomic emission spectrum of hydrogen now notice again that there's only four colors that are used to make up that one singular color from hydrogen so red blue green blue violet and violet all again mash up to make whatever hydrogen looks like and actually these are the four colors that are very characteristic and unique to hydrogen no other element will give off the same four colors here um, that will again con constitute its own color so hydrogen again is unique in that it only gives off these four other elements will have a whole another range of uh, atomic emission spectrum with a whole different set of colors and whatnot but for now just recognize that these four come from hydrogen how is this applicable again to what we're talking about but remember there our goal here is to figure out uh, electrons how are electrons arranged well one thing that was figured out is that actually each color corresponds to a very specific way that the or uh, electrons are again uh, exist so according to calculations that were performed I remember this is all very preliminary and not you know uh, at least this is very rudimentary and is not what we consider to be correct today but what we, one thing we thought of is that each individual electron would sort of uh, circle around around the nucleus on each of these rings. Right? So again, these are, you can usually call them orbits or rings. Uh, but essentially what happens is that for every single time that an electron is excited, all right, and then comes back down and relaxes, um, it'll give off a certain color. All right, so let's say for this one right here, let's focus on the red. So this color red comes from the fact that a certain electron was excited from where it normally is, so from here up to some other place, and then back down. In this case, it goes from the third to the second orbits. How is it excited? Well, that's where the electricity came in from earlier. So we put some current through it. Electrons are excited. goes from one energy level to the next, or one ring to the next, and then it relaxes again. So in this case, the third energy level goes back down to the second energy level. Right? Now, when it goes, uh, it gets excited, it goes up to the third, it relaxes back down to the second, it releases the energy. Now, again, each of these are energy levels, so each uh, there's a certain difference in energy, and that energy is given off as light, and that is again ca very characteristic of this right here. As a side note, um, this one is reported as uh, this wavelength and it was reported as 6565a with a little circle thing on top that's actually an angstrom which represents 10 to the negative 10th um, uh, in this case it would be meters since it is a wavelength um, over here with the cyan or this blue green right here um, the earlier the electricity was exciting the electrons uh, that were sitting on the second energy level up to the fourth energy level and when it relaxes it comes back down to the second energy level and in the process releases all that energy in the form of this blue uh, green color and again there's no angstroms here uh, for this and this goes on and on right, so again they figured out that this is actually true for hydrogen that whatever colors you see comes from very direct uh, excitation and relaxations of electrons around the nucleus uh, so you might recognize the guy who uh, essentially was the core of all this. This is our friend, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 Niels Bohr, um, and he generated what we now call the Bohr model, where each ring is represented, uh, representing an energy level. Right. Uh, so each ring again has some specific uh, uh, you know number associated with it that we don't know about, um, and then it again uh, has a several rings around them. And each of them is an energy level. The term we see here again is quantized, meaning that we can't have energy levels uh, in between other ones. Right? The, pretty much electrons have to rest on the energy levels and nowhere else. It cannot be in between, uh, if you remember from our stair step example, versus the ramp. All right, so we can't have uh, the this this uh, dot here rest anywhere along where my pointer is pointing here because that is not allowable. It has to be directly on one of these steps and nowhere in between. Uh, also, the electrons orbit the nucleus on the specific rings, right? Um, and if there's enough energy added, which I was talking about earlier from an excitation, uh, electrons can be excited to higher energy levels. And once they uh, relax, it goes back down to its ground state, and the energy that's released is the light that we see. Uh, each energy level can, can hold a maximum of two 
n squared, where n is the energy level. So the first string is at n equals 1, the second, the next larger ring is n equals 2, and the next largest ring is n equals 3, and so on and so forth. So as an example, again, if I was talking about an n equals 3 electron, or n equals 3 energy level, the maximum number of electrons they could hold would be 18. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. Remember the order of operations. And finally, again, the Bohr model is based off his studies on the hydrogen atomic emission spectrum, and again, specifically hydrogen. Uh, some examples that we can go through here, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, some possibilities. Um, I, uh, I don't have the dot maker thing for uh, what I want to do here, but you get the idea. So beryllium, beryllium, if you take a look at the PR table, uh, you can figure out that it has three, no, excuse me, it has one, two, three, four electrons. And so you fill them in accordingly. On the first string, since this is n equals one, this first string right here, this first energy level, it can hold a maximum of two electrons. So you would put a dot on, uh, uh, two dots anyway, on the first string. Then you would notice that you have two other electrons to assign, and they can't fit on the first string anymore. So you would actually put two more dots on the next string. So dot and then dot. Um, and that's pretty much it. All right, so you have four electrons. You assign them all. Sulfur is the same way. Sulfur, again, you start off the same way by looking at the number of electrons. You have 16 electrons to assign. The first string can hold a maximum of two. So you would put dot, dot. And then the second energy level, you can have a maximum of 8, right, because 2n squared, and 2 squared is 4, then times 2 is 8. So you would put 8 more on here, and you've therefore assigned 10 total. But that leaves 6 left over to be assigned, so with, again, the third energy level, you would go ahead and assign the last 6, because this can hold a maximum of 18, uh, but there's only 6 left over to assign, so you'd have dot, 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 and then the sixth one dot. It doesn't really matter how it's arranged or where it is specifically around the dot, uh, circle. Just put it on there somewhere. Anyway, we can talk about that later. Next one, a couple of shortcomings of the board model. Uh, you can take a second and read over this, but I'm going to move on. Uh, further developments, a couple of uh, concepts you should recognize. The first one is that uh, instead of light behaving as waves or light behaving as uh, particles, well, it turns out that, and kind of flip it around the other way, sometimes if you study waves, uh, they can actually uh, sort of, or at least if you study the particles, they can actually behave like waves. And this is something that's also a little different, too. We're not going to get into any of the major developments with this one. Just recognize that Louis de Broglie, this is a name you probably want to recognize, um, is the concept that matter or particles behave as waves or at least demonstrates wave properties. So if you take a baseball and you fling it really hard in any one direction uh, because it has a mass and it has a velocity, it will demonstrate some wave properties. Uh, there's actually calculations that go with it. We're not going to do a single one for this class. Next one is Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. You might recognize it, uh, this name right here, Heisenberg, from a very famous TV show on AMC. Um, but whatever case, uh, he essentially said that it's fundamentally impossible to determine the, both the exact momentum and position of an electron in space. And this means that I can neither know where it is or how fast it's going at the same time. I can only know one or the other in varying probabilities. And this is, again, well beyond what we were going to cover in this scope. Just recognize the name. Moving on. Quantum mechanical model. All right, so this is the actual modern model of the atom that we accept today. We are no longer, again, looking at rings of electrons around uh, the nucleus. In this case is the quantum mechanical model. Uh, you should recognize this name, Erwin Schrodinger, for various reasons. Uh, but the main contribution in this context is the wave functions. And the wave functions, if you look over here to your right, is typically represented with the Greek letter psi, and that's P-S-I, um, and then psi squared. Uh, but... Uh, and this is actually you know, a whole set of mathematical expressions. Um, it is very complicated and involves fi fairly uh, involved uh, calculus, and you're more than welcome to look at it at your own time. Uh, but essentially, his wave functions were essentially used to represent electrons and where they can found. As a result of a mathematical expression, you can therefore, again, plot things out. So in a three-dimensional plot, it represents the probability or the three-dimensional regions in which it is most probable to find electrons. These three-dimensional uh, uh, regions are called orbitals. Uh, orbitals. Now, this is not the same thing as that term orbits we saw earlier with the Bohr model. Uh, now, one thing you should know is that, uh, I'm going to come back to this slide in just a minute, but one thing that you can know um, is that orbitals are essentially solutions. So these are like the mathematical answers to those wave functions that we saw earlier. Um, and they actually form these 3D shapes, and so a couple of these you need to know. You definitely need to know the S orbital, which is essentially a sphere. Um, the P orbital, which is called the dumbbell, but right now it kind of looks like a, you know, a double-lobed or really, really, you know, like a really... 
skinny shaft uh, ore of some kind. I don't know. Um, and and then they, we'll, we'll see examples of how that looks like a, you know, a dumbbell later. And you have your D orbital, which is a little bit more complex. Um, the four types you need to recognize are the S, P, D, and F. Uh, I'm not going to get into that for right now. Just recognize S, P, D, and F are the four types. I've only shown you three. Uh, the F type is a little bit more involved. Um, and remember that each orbital, each individual orbital can hold a maximum of two, and this should be the word electrons right here. Um, just be careful about this one. Um, I, I know we well, the language will get a little mixed up here in just a moment, uh, but we definitely want to pay attention to the fact that orbit holes is the entirety of this. So this whole thing can hold a maximum of two electrons. This entire thing can hold a maximum of two electrons. Where specifically they are, it doesn't really matter. Right? One of them might be over here, and the other one might be over here. Or you, one might be in here, and one might, might be down here. Again, we're not really sure because, remember, this is a probability of where the electrons can be. Moving on. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to use a short analogy here to sort of talk about how these uh, electrons are arranged. Um, so this is again our college dorm. So our college dorm again is a place where first of all most of you will end up in a few years. Uh, but is a nice analogy because it sort of shows us the structure of how this works. Now let's say you are a uh, coordinator of some kind and you have to assign a bunch of residents to some dorm rooms. Now let me go ahead and show you uh, essentially how the dorm room looks. So the next page right here is a bunch of floor plans. You see that over here in the top left this is the first floor, your second Second floor, your third floor, and your fourth floor. Again, this is totally hypothetical. This is just saying, you know, if we, this is an example, so don't read too much into this. Your dining hall at your school may actually be on the second floor. Again, your results may may vary. So right here, you have uh, on the first floor, you have a single room, and that's our S. Now again, you can probably see where this analogy is going. This represents the S orbitals. On the second floor, you have the S and a couple of P rooms. In this case, again, P orbitals. The third floor, you have the S's and the P's again. Right, and then you also have a new set of rooms called your D's, and then on the fourth floor you have your S, your P's, your D's, and again another type on the fourth floor. The first time we see these rooms are the F rooms. So each room again is going to house two residents. All right, so um, according to the rules on the previous slide, we'll go back to this. Is uh, Mr. Alfbaus says you're going to fill from the lowest floor first, and then you're going to build up. I think that's pretty logical. Right, start from the low ground level first, and then work your way up to the top. The second rule, Mr. Pauli says that in each room you need to fill up the top bunk first and then the bottom bunk so we don't want to have a top bunk and then a top bunk or have a bottom bunk then a bottom bunk now some of you may be thinking why not the bottom bunk and the top bunk you can but again the, the whole idea is that we're just trying to get two people in the room and make sure they're not assigned to the same bed this keeps it consistent in the last rule mr. Hun says in a group of rooms of the same type so for example in a group of these rooms right here uh, same, of the same type. Do not pair up roommates until each room has at least one resident. Right? So one resident in each room first. Uh, therefore, you will see this pattern happen. Now, okay, I'm going to pause here for just a moment, and I want you guys to pick up where uh, I left off, uh, where I leave off anyway, just a moment.